Um, Hunter is not going to be here, and Eric is probably going to be late. He, it's possible he might not be able to make it, but we should not wait for for Eric. He said so. Is he watching the Manchester United game? Actually, yes, that is what he's doing. Yeah, <laughs> I don't, I don't know the results of anything, uh, but yeah, I'll probably be the tell based off the affects that. Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe we'll see. Whether he has sad or joyful affects when he shows yeah. up. <laughs> um, I, I, I was mentioning before some of you came that if, if you don't mind to start out, I was really interested both in today's reading and last week's reading uh, to try to work through uh, at least one of the issues today uh, about the role of reason. Because in last uh, week's um uh, reading uh, on page 73, uh, I think it's page 73, and then it says reason leads to civil society, and yet in this section, uh, in multiple places, but one place was, um, was, was, was 156, Roman numeral 13, that, um, not everybody, not every man is equally, sus I don't want to say susceptible, but but um, but men vary. There being few who live according to the rule of reason. So in these two sections, I, I, I was getting a sense of Spinoza saying that reason, it was the most important, um, for lack of a better word, cause for the creation of the state, for civil society. Yet at the same time, last week and this week, he seems to suggest that, um, that well, two things. One, that, that reason is not the only uh, thing that motivates human beings. But secondly, that most men don't seem to be motivated by reason as often as one would like. So I, I wanted to just throw that out to see what, what y'all's sense of it was. Or if if I'm misreading something on on one way or the other, and my my attention is directed to page one thirty six when he's like bringing up. So I guess this is from last week's reading when he is talking about I guess the civil state. Um, and I haven't like sifted through this, but I just was looking for that that conversation and seeing it appear on on one thirty five to one thirty six. 135, I think it starts with like that scolium two. And he says, a few, a few words must be said about man's natural state, natural state in his civil state. <clears throat> and then so I'm seeing him just talk about men living according to the guidance of reason. Ideal in this, if this was like the case, then we wouldn't be harming each other. Um, but I think 136 may have what I would imagine are maybe some some guidance there, but. I'm seeing things like the society is kind of prescribing common rules of life um, through like threat, but not through reason. So like in the middle of 136, I see in this way, society has the power to prescribe a common rule of life, to make laws, to maintain them, not by reason, which cannot restrain the affects, but by threats. Um, so yeah, I think I'm, it's just painting this picture of like, yeah, what is the role of reason in, in relation to the state? And then I know I'm, I'm not seeing the lines right in front of me, but I feel like somewhere he says that the state provides like the conditions for us to be able to live through reason. Right. But but uh, Joey, that's what was confusing to me because uh, thank you for pointing out that paragraph on page 136 because he is, I mean, to me, he's, he's saying that very explicitly society can be maintained, right? But but by laws and the power it has of preserving itself, but it, it's it's not he is explicit saying not by reason which can't restrain. But then that that's maintenance. But he seems to say on page uh, I thought it was seventy three reason leads to civil society, which put him diff to me differently from Hobbes's conception of of of, of really what was the motor force uh, leading to uh, leading to the state. Um, and that's, that's, uh, it, I mean, just because 
an author is saying that the reason why something is created doesn't necessarily mean that that would be the same reason for its maintenance. But it seemed like uh, Spinoza was emphasizing the role of reason as something that was very important. I mean, I'm just playing with this idea off the top of my head, but it almost seems like, an, you know, maybe I am stretching this too far now that it's about to come out of my mouth. But this idea that, you know, he's been kind of toying with for a while, they're like, hey, reason is this super great thing that taps into this like core aspect of the universe and can help us to understand our lives and our relationships with other people. Um, but it's, you know, not something that everybody possesses. It almost seems like there's this sort of uh, implication that a society that is going to be built on reason would be need to, to be done so by the reasonable few. And I'm not going to go so far as to say the like the philosopher king, right? But if the overwhelming majority of people are captured by the affects, uh, it kind of puts us into a position where we've got like a, like almost like a reason technocracy that can govern what the state needs and need not do or or some kind of oligarchy or something if there's not a better term for it um which makes me wonder if spinoza would uh see democracy as like a a quote-unquote reasonable way to govern if the idea of the state is supposed to be to to utilize affectatious methods you know fear uh, hope, etc., in order to get across what are ultimately reasonable ends, um, you would need someone to be able to, or a group of people to be able to see through all of that mire to what like the reasonable end is, which is interesting. I guess, you know, I, I'm finding myself like thinking about the associations that maybe I personally have of that view. And then, um, like, I do see Spinoza kind of making this argument that it's in our interest to help other people to like guide them to reason as opposed to him just saying few men like few men are in possession of reason so you know f them I, you know i feel like there's multiple instances where spinoza says like it's in our best interest to like support men finding reason um but yeah i guess i'm, I'm seeing him almost propose the state which is kind of like creating these laws through threats, basically by by kind of like the state is like a a necessary response to the fact that we aren't run by reason, but we are ran by affects, which tend to kind of overpower our reason. But it's almost like he's saying that if all of us could be run by reason, then the state of nature would do just fine. But since that's not the case, we need the state to kind of impose threats and then, you know, play on this, on this, or, you know, find this level playing field with, with the affects, fight fire with fire almost. Yeah, I think I, the only thing I would push back on at all is this, uh, the idea that like, I think Spinoza would, would say like, you're a hundred percent right. We're, we're not trying to screw people. We're trying to uplift them. but they can't see the reason that's why they need the affectatious methods which i i don't even know if that's a word but i'm going to use it now because it sounds good um fear hope etc power coercion in order to to do what is best for them whether or not they even recognize that um so yeah i mean it, but it's an i mean it's an interesting way of looking at it i didn't think about that before so I put this in the chat. This is kind of my guess, but that reasonable people, I mean, it does sound a bit like uh, philosopher kings, but reasonable people would establish rational principles for the state, but those rational principles would have to take into account the fact that most people are not motivated by reason. And so then the state's going to have to employ coercive means to to uh, enforce reasonable behavior among the unreasonable many, um, which which could still be, I mean, I, I could still see, you know, like Chase said that he did favor democracy. You could you could still say that, well, if democracy is the most reasonable form of government, you can't you 
you know, so if you had a, a society of perfectly rational people, then maybe I'm guessing, I don't know, but then maybe you would have, you could have a sort of an anarchist democracy that you wouldn't really need any enforcement or any rulers because people would just do what's right all, always. But given that most people will not, then you have to, reasonable people have to establish, you know, these principles of coercion to require people to behave in the proper way. You know, that's my guess, something like that. Yeah, now that you bring it up, I do remember that idea that, uh, you know, he's in favor of democracy, which uh, is interesting considering the like, what, what, so I don't know, I, I'm borrowing from other places here too, but a lot of arguments, if you guys ever argue esoteric politics on the internet, we'll hear from people who advocate for like radical political structures, like any of them, oligarchies, monarchies, theocracies, whatever, is they, they will very, very often talk poorly about democracy in the sense that like too, most people are too stupid to know what the government ought to be doing, et cetera, yada, yada. And I don't think Spinoza is saying that in, in that particular statement, but I get whiffs of that with the idea that like most people probably won't ever come to like reason it reason in the sense of opening themselves up to understanding the universe you know this this spinozan concept of reason which is more so than just like applying your brain to numbers and you know reasoning it's this like greater message about understanding the universe your place in it how you interact with other people um it makes it yeah i mean it's interesting to to think about how democracy would function if both of those things are true and the, the goal of the state is to uphold the reason, even if through affectatious means. Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. Oh, yeah, he's basically Hitler. That's my <laughs> that's my uh, conclusion. But, 100%. Uh, yeah, so reason in this for the the state and the role that it would play for that. I think, uh, is it Joey who said this? The, I think the idea that the state ideally would be the condition so that you could become reasonable, that's kind of the, the key idea, I think, in that relation. Is, okay, if we're, if we don't have cities or you know civil associations with people we really have no chance of becoming rational there's uh it's not going to happen so that's why he thinks that okay you know so if i if there's some i don't know a baby out in the woods you know there's i mean aside from all the survival aspects Instead, there really needs to be some kind of support system around people that gives it a favorable environment so that whatever this a person can progress enough in order to realize uh, their rationality, which would be so I think uh, it'd probably help to try to um so there's the tendency when thinking of reason to think of it as this kind of disembodied abstract kind of oh i don't it's just you know understanding something uh, you know it's but i think what is unique for spinoza is that reason is is that but he sees that it's a much more concrete and embodied thing because if you think about it okay reason is our nature insofar as our nature is this striving to increase our power or to preserve our being and reason is just kind of the 
maximization of that and it's it works through being able to organize the encounters that we undergo so that it's uh, tilted towards that maximum. So uh, to act in accord with reason, you know, that's uh, a term he uses a lot, would be something along the lines of to do whatever increases you're striving towards increasing power, virtue, good. Uh, all those things are synonymous. And he thinks that the having a state would work that way. Um, but the thing is, so for the democracy and, you know, the, the ideas of, or, uh, say an aristocracy or a monarchy or whatnot. Um, I think ultimately what it comes down to would be if it's, so if a, if you have some kind of king who was uh, extremely rational, say theoretically, and had some kind of absolute power to impose whatever on people, uh, I think it would still, there would still be a lot of very complex intricacies that would make that very unlikely to happen. Uh, so the, the ration, the philosopher king, as the problem of uh, implementation, I would say that. So even if the the philosopher king understands what is best, what is what tends towards the best thing, trying to actually implement that is a whole nother thing. But uh, either way, whatever government it is, for it to be, you know according to the dictates of reason would it be just this to whatever increases our collective power the most which is the same as our individual power where power doesn't mean uh hitler but um capacity to keep striving to preserve ourselves, which means this kind of ongoing activity of being able to increase our joyful affects and our powers and all that good stuff. So he thinks that a democracy works best generally in that uh, people would be able to best determine for themselves and um, from that, be able to, well, I, don't, I think it's, okay, if you think of how he thinks of activity, you know, active affects as opposed to passive ones. So when you're the adequate cause of, of, an, of what you do, that's your action. So he sees that as that's kind of like the full position of our power right there instead of our actions being determined by external causes. He thinks that democracy works in a way that's similar to that, where we would decide things that work uh, in determining us in a way that's kind of self-determining. So it makes people more autonomous, although that's still abstract in the sense that there could be, if you do have a completely irrational population, say, or of democratic citizens, they could do things that are very much against reason, and you, they could, I don't know, vote to all die together. I don't know, it's kind of like Jonestown kind of thing, and uh, that so 
obviously that would not be rational for for Spinoza. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of complicated uh, in that just one thing doesn't necessarily always work better than the other. Uh, you kind of have to pay attention to the the specifics of you know the society that you're talking about. Yeah, well, when you were talking, and and I messed up. I, I I put P for both proposition and page. My bad. It's proposition seventy three, page one fifty four. Um, and Chase, when you were talking, is this is that proposition, and then is conversation getting to what you were talking about in terms of? kind of like how people for lack of a better term are fulfilled in the state more than in solitary living a man who is guided by reason is more free in a state where he lives according to a common decision than in solitude when he only uh, when he obeys only himself and then and then the, de the demonstration in is a man who is guided by reason is not led to obey by fear but insofar as he strives to preserve his being from the dictates of dictative reason that is insofar as he strives to live freely desires to maintain the principle of common life and common advantage consequently he desires to live according to the common decision of the state therefore a man who is guided by reason desires in order to live more freely to keep the common laws of the state and what was also weird about that that sounded very rousseauian to me i mean did rousseau ever read spinoza Because he's saying you will be more free when you're in a community and you listen to the dictates of the state. But that doesn't contradict what you said, Chase, about his saying that democracy is his preferred form of government. I, I see him saying that because of how it it gives us maybe like that, that interruption or that distance from the, the power of the affects. And it allows us to kind of like use other men and I am, i'm recalling him just talking about how the most useful thing to us is other men and so it's like whatever is necessary for us to kind of be in common quote unquote common decision with other men is going to be the best thing for us yeah it would have to be extreme circumstances for it to be better to uh, say live completely off the grid you know, like a uh, just complete, uh, completely. I don't know if you go live in the woods and just tr don't see anybody just completely self sustained like that. Uh, that for that to be better than to live in a city means that your your cities are pretty bad, like really bad. And but yeah, I think that uh, that proposition, uh, Ed, that you read, I think that is uh, that's definitely the I think the main kind of point of what he's saying. Why we so that's really okay. So that's uh, you know what the reasonable person would do with a state kind of, um, which is basically okay. Yeah, follow the rules uh you know that's been decided on common laws whatnot all this okay um although i think there's the other facet would be kind of that the the state the city is that that helps to actually have reasonable people that it, it's the condition that helps bring about reasonable people that would then follow these uh laws and whatnot but also uh if you want reasonable people and you want reasonable people to follow the laws then i think it follows that the laws should be also in accord with the reason so if you have you know terrible arbitrary draconian laws uh i think spinoza would yeah he would not be down with that and that's why he thought that to be able to have freedom of thought and discussion and free speech and whatnot was very important. Uh, so I, I read something that was saying that um, he could possibly be considered the first uh, modern 
Democrat, uh, and as an advocate of democracy, that he was the first kind of modern democracy advocate, um, which is interesting. Is, uh, it, you know, it's very different from the way the democracy, I think, is understood today. Uh, and also very different from especially how the Greeks, their democracy was uh, very different as well. But, yeah. Maybe, like, I don't remember where this is. And, like, I'm wondering if I may have read it from a secondary text or if it's somewhere in Spinoza, so if this sounds familiar to y'all. But does he talk about, like, like the laws that a society creates? Or particularly, say, something like the laws of morality that come from this or that religion? And how it's like, it's, it's more effective for them to kind of squash out these, like, other affects with just maybe more powerful sad affects as opposed to offering like positive uplifting to virtue and now that i'm now that i'm saying it i'm wondering if he mentions this in the section where he's talking about like using fear instead of like pointing out virtue or basically like you know instilling fear instead of teaching virtue and how like how this is kind of like an adaptive call from one standpoint where it's like we we or a particular society that's not necessarily guided by reason is just forced to kind of like, you know, play the affect game and find stronger, all those sad passions, but stronger ones that overpower the weaker ones. And I guess I'm, I'm getting the sense that it might paint this picture that like the free reasonable man wouldn't be part of that. But I'm hearing that like maybe Spinoza is saying that the free reasonable man recognizes that like the society or the civil state, like imposing these laws, um, is still trying to kind of like bring us into commonality with other men, which ends up being useful enough for us to get us to the point of like living in accordance with reason, at which point maybe then we'd be better off um, like revising these laws or basically learning how to teach virtue. Um, again, in that almost more like that positive affirmative sense as opposed to the, to the negative fear and threats. Um, but I guess I maybe I, I see the the conversation we're having as being this idea that the free reasonable man doesn't need to turn away from the state, but like needs to kind of like uplift the state um, and and kind of like you know, raise it to the next power. But... Well, but it it is interesting that his it, it seems like when he's talking about the state and and the people in it, his his emphasis is is on you know, not fear, right? You know, it, it's it, it's in line. It, it, it is, it, I mean, I can see why there's a little D democratic reading for it because can you really have a functioning democracy based on fear, anger, and hate of, of the citizens? I mean, we're going through a lot of that now in the United States and I don't see that as a healthy emotional basis for representative government. And so to me, I mean, he's very insightful to be talking about, and I'm not doing justice to it, but, you know, um, uh, he talks about fear. He talks about um, wanting to atone, which I, I thought hit repentance. I thought that was interesting. He thought that was actually a negative. But he goes through through these different emotions and saying, well, some of this is actually a motivation that's actually not going to be helpful uh, in, in, in a sense of sustaining a, a civil society and improving um, I I improving the citizenry. Yeah, so the, the he talks about the superstitious. It's a proposition proposition sixty three. The scolium, uh, which I, so I don't know what what page for the penguin edition, but at the top there, the scolium, the superstitious. So the superstitious know how to reproach people for their vices better than 
they know how to teach them virtues, and they strive not to guide men by reason, but to restrain them by fear, so that they flee the evil rather than love virtues. Such people aim only to make others as wretched as they are themselves, as they themselves are. So it is no wonder that they are generally burdensome and hateful to men. Uh, by desire arising from reason, we directly follow the good and indirectly. Okay, that's kind of going to something else. But yeah, so that that's page one forty nine and one fifty in the Penguin. For those of you who have Penguin, one forty nine fifty. Begging your pardon, Chase. Go ahead. Oh no, thank you. Uh, so yeah, that's part of uh, definitely that critique that he has is that okay, there there is a social function to having fear and a few other uh, sad affects. Um, but ultimately reason is going to try to get beyond those. Um, and yeah, the superstitious, this idea that he has a uh, where, okay. I think you can think of it as uh, what is the proper role of religion in the state? Uh I think he would say something along the lines of it helps to kind of build a community affect, uh, but, and it also that it's able to kind of uh, keep people's ideas somewhat together in uh, a kind of harmony where they, instead of, uh, Maybe they don't understand these things in a complete in a rational way. Why they have to do something like uh, be good to each other or don't murder each other or something like that. So the idea would be, okay, you come up with stories, you know, mythology or whatnot uh, that encourages people to do those actions. So they be doing reasonable actions like not murdering people uh but they're doing it because not because they understand it on a rational level but because they've been determined by a stronger affect of fear compared to what would motivate them to whatever do the murder um so that's yeah because that's that's really what the the state is on some level is that okay if if i fear this the consequences of what i'm going to do more as a preventative from doing this supposedly bad thing that's kind of the principle of the state although the thing is you can see how that is quite different from reason or reason you understand why it's actually it's good to do that thing in itself for all people and you don't need to uh, fear anything or believe any inadequate ideas because you know the adequate idea of why it's good to do that so you can see how they have uh yeah the state ends up slightly kind of bending people towards reason on a mass level but still does not fully get there so it's a it's a really complex relation but yeah um, i want to speak to that point because i think these he gives the examples of like shame and pain so on, on the bottom of page 146 this is proposition 58 the second to last paragraph he gives the examples of shame and pain as something that's good right but he kind of signals them as almost like temporary goods or like he's like shame kind of indicates a desire to live honorably he says though not a virtue is still good in so far as it indicates a desire to live honorably and he says pain is said to be good in so far as it indicates that the injured part is not yet decayed and then at the end of that proposition that chase was pointing out so on page 150 what is that proposition 63 the last paragraph the scolium he gives the example of like a healthy man enjoying his food versus a sick man 
eating what he he needs to even though he doesn't like it right and it's like his it's like his his physiology isn't adjusted to kind of like having a healthy measure of what, of what is needed um and that's interesting. like i'm recalling nietzsche talk about physiologists like we need great physiologists <laughs> and i think what chase was saying earlier about spinoza kind of finds this like embodied reason Yeah, it was so the the ideas that are adequate would be about you know because the mind is a is of the body, its object is the body. So these adequate ideas that he's talking about would be about you know relations of bodies, affects of bodies, and that's what is gonna. You know, kind of what reason is to be able to understand how those affections of bodies work, how they give rise to certain affects, and you know what what affections and relations of bodies actually will will increase the power of those bodies and which will decrease it. And that's so yeah, I think it's that's a that's very important to keep that in mind when thinking of Spinoza because otherwise it can just seem like well yeah we have this uh image of the word reason and we can just go by that and then extrapolate from that but then I think at that point Spinoza starts to get left behind um yeah Uh, but yeah, so speaking of Nietzsche and, you know, uh, yeah, really interesting critique, critiques of the, the sad passions, where I think it was the one about pity, especially, that was interesting, and that yeah. it's a it's a pretty sophisticated argument that, okay, so even... So pity would be a kind of sadness at someone else's sadness. So he's saying that that in itself as a as a sad affect, that is bad. But there's kind of a lot of things around that that can actually be good things. So we can understand that. Uh, so one thing is kind of, OK, well, what if I am led to act because i feel pity for someone so his idea is that well you would act uh from pity based off of action not based off of the sadness itself so i think a the rational person in this case uh would uh not be moved just by the affect of pity but instead maybe uh the rational person could even experience the affect but would be able to separate the affect from uh its cause and then be able to understand the sadness of the other person and why uh and then well how you could act in order to actually improve that. So that is really what he he would want to do for pity is say, okay, the sadness in itself is never good. Uh, but what is good that seems to come from pity is actually coming from our our activity, which is not the sadness of the pity. And in fact, we can, for anything that, any action that we can be determined to do based off of affects, these sad affects, we can also be determined to do based off of reason without the sad affects. So that I think is very important to understanding the basic structure of 
how all this works for him. And uh, yeah, quite. So he does the same thing with a lot of stuff. Um, Despondency. What was that? That was. um, 50. Oh. I can't find it, but the the critique of despondency and how that's similar to pride, where uh wait, okay, I think okay, yeah, it's um fifty seven so first talks about pride, okay, the proud man loves the presence of parasites or flatters, but hates the presence of the noble, okay, so. Uh, I'd say I've I thought of this as the the Donald Trump proposition. Not so much about him specifically, more kind of the Donald Trump archetype uh as being the proud man. Uh and the way that that is analyzed is, you know, ultimately this the love of the love of being flattered with this pride comes from a misunderstanding of the self of who your own nature and your power. Uh, and it's really this false image of the self that then becomes uh, this kind of as a sort of gravitational effect that where we become determined by just wanting to continuously have this increase to that, that false image of ourselves rather than to what is actually in our power and towards actually increasing that power. So instead it's, yeah, it's a very interesting idea. And then despondency, how that is so similar to it, but it's this, in fact, it's just this sadness that, okay, well, because he judges his own lack of power from the power of others, uh, and the same thing with the proud person would be, yeah, power is judged according to this comparison with others and how that brings about this reactive, um, so what, I think the term, so envy, he t- yeah, envy would be, that's basically Nietzsche's raisonnement. Um, where, yeah, but that's the common, uh, consequence, it seems like, for despondency, superstition, pride, a a lot of the, the sad affects, it seems like, and the fact that he says that so many, it has this false appearance of morality, I think, also he says, and that it's connected with the superstition of religion. I mean, it seems uh, very Nietzschean to me. Although, uh, I mean, obviously there's big differences between them, but uh, that part is really interesting. He he doesn't. I don't uh, tell me Chase and, and and others if if I don't think he uses the term, but I get a sense in 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 these in the in this section in last week's, you know, that it's. I mean, I it's like he's 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 saying you really need to be self disciplined, right? You, you have to be very aware of your emotional state. Or it could take you down very bad paths, bad in quotation marks. You know what I mean? I don't. I don't mean a moral bad, but it it won't be good for you, and it won't be good for the community you're a part of, right? It, it's almost like you know how when people talk about cultivating virtues, uh, you know, almost in a Roman sense. Um, but but I, I think he's he's I, you know, from what you were saying, it seems like because it's it's always almost like a binary right well you don't you don't want to have this overwhelming pride but you also don't want to abase yourself right you don't you you want to have a proper sense of your your right relation to others and and you can you can 
you can pat yourself on the back too much, but you also can kick yourself in the in the teeth too much, and don't do that. I mean, and again, it's 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 by these different propositions that he's that he's saying, look at really where these emotions or these feelings come from, and and it's uh, he may he may use the phrase false modesty somewhere because it seems to me the term false modesty would fit into um, uh, uh, Spinoza's psychological analysis. And to that, to that point, I'm recalling some of the pieces too, where not even just necessarily like being disciplined towards, I guess, your own, your own affects, but like, you know, the, the ideas that he says about being weary of like, I don't remember if he uses this term, but the, the unreasonable person's favor <laughs> or the multitude, he's like, the multitude is fickle. Like if you judge yourself by their opinion, then, you know, it's like, who knows where you'll end up or just the idea of like, the, the, the favor part was interesting to me. I didn't, I didn't know whether to read it as like their, their positive opinion of you, like they favor you or like don't accept favors from them. <laughs> I don't know why I was initially reading it like positive opinion, but then he said something on the the second page where he's talking about that, I don't have my book in front of me, but where it made it sound like he was saying, like, be weary of like accepting favors from, you know, people who aren't like reasonable or aren't as virtuous. This idea of like, if you owe someone who's not like on that level of virtue, then like what you would need to do to repay them may end up like, like being against your power or virtue. Um, but yeah, I think, I, I guess, you know, to me, it's just saying some of that stuff, I feel like it kind of echoes this Nietzschean sense in a bit, but um, I guess yeah, well, I also it, see it kind of tying into what you're saying, Ed. Um, it's, thanks for bringing that up. On, on page 146, it's, his, it's in his discussion of Proposition 58, love of esteem is not contrary to reason, but can arise from it. And then it's the, the scholastic uh, conversation when he says the love of esteem, which is called empty, is the self-esteem that is encouraged only by the opinion of the multitude. And I thought that that, that paragraph there was very insightful. And, and I didn't necessarily see it as, a, to use a modern phrase, a dissing of public opinion, but, but it's just a frank acknowledgement that uh, it can change very quickly. And, you know, you, you can be praised and then you can be damned for the multitude is fickle and inconstant. Unless one's reputation is guarded, it is quickly destroyed. Indeed, because everyone desires to secure the applause of the multitude, each one willingly puts down the reputation of the other. And since the struggle is over a good thought to be the to be the highest, this gives rise to a monstrous lust. I think that's a real interesting phrase. A monstrous lust of each to crush the other in any way possible. The one who at last emerges as victor exalts more in having harmed the other than in having benefited himself. This love of self-esteem of esteem then is really empty because it is nothing. I mean, that's to me, this that he wrote that in the 1500s is amazing. Because it's not like there are a lot of republics around, representative governments around. And for him to, I mean, that you could you could every single person who's ever elected to office should read that. Yeah. So I when appreciate I appreciate what you said. Go ahead, Joy. I'm just going to quickly say I appreciate what you said, Ed. That it doesn't feel like he's dissing public opinion. And to compare with Nietzsche, like it feels like Nietzsche is always like firing shots. Where Spinoza, it feels like he's just kind of being frank. Like he's just kind of letting you know. Yeah, I think he still has the a suspicion of the multitude clearly and he is he acknowledges that by and large they're irrational uh they're filled with envy uh plenty of things like that uh but at the same time yeah there's a different kind of relation he has compared to nietzsche although nietzsche's i mean obviously it's more negative but i think it's still kind of uh 
still complex in its own right. Uh, but yeah, that. But what's interesting? So yeah, so fifty-eight. This one. This would be something along the lines. So I think one important thing to to think about this is. So when you're reading the ethics, he's really who is he writing to? His audience is the the reader. So in a way, this is kind of saying, okay, you, the reader, uh, when thinking about the multitude, you know, uh, trying to get the approval of the multitude, this is why it's not a good idea, which isn't. So that is not necessarily, yeah, a dis on the multitude, but it, more of a understanding of the danger that they possess if you become determined by their approval because of, uh, well, how ridiculous it is. So that's why I think, yeah, this this proposition. I think so when I read it, I thought of social media. I thought what Facebook, Twitter, the way that it's really kind of the anti rational. Uh, so if, if reason organizes encounters so that things agree with each other, so that things could combine and these agreeable relations in order to mutually increase power. Uh, social media seems to be the exact opposite as a kind of anti-rational organization of, of affects. Or, yeah, you've got, I think it's a really good example of what he's talking about as what does it mean to be determined by these external causes? And uh, that's bad, you know, uh, and how it can relate to us. I think this proposition is, uh, makes that much more clear and relevant to our own time that, okay. Yeah. If you are determined, if your self-esteem is determined indeed by other people's opinion of you, then this takes away some power from your own power to be able to self to be able to understand yourself and your own power. And instead, you will see yourself based off of this image given to you by the opinions of the multitude. But then he talks about how, okay, first of all, for the person to be that's in this situation, uh, he who exalts at being esteemed by the multitude is made anxious daily, strives, acts, and schemes in order to preserve his reputation. For the multitude is fickle and inconstant. So that's quite clear about why, okay, yeah. I think the way that this has become internalized within so many people, this uh, the constant presence of our online personas that, yeah, this this really seems to be relevant to that. This daily anxious striving to just try to keep up one's image in for the multitude for but then at the same time from an a slightly different perspective he kind of explains the structure of it and why it leads towards these bad encounters where because they're driven by this kind of pride to try to be the best, it leads towards uh, this envy where people just want to mutually cut each other down. And yeah, that seems to be 
if you look at Twitter, that's kind of all it really is. Um, it's like, how can we, how can we possibly organize communication in a way where people agree with each other as little as possible, but in order to get them hooked on these affects, keep them scrolling through these, you know, chains of dopamine. How do we do that? That's, that's basically what Twitter is. And so I think this also relates to something that has been relevant for quite a while that he um, he's mentioned before, but I think in this reading, it was much more prominent. And that's, okay, so he says that what is good, joy is good, you know, which you can take that and say, okay, so now genital mutilation joy equals good but that's not at all what he's saying uh so there's this distinction between a passive joy and an active joy and the passive joy which is still a passion it's still determined by these external causes he really talks about how those are a one of these culprits to getting people uh, sucked into these these structures that determine our affects, and I think that that is a perfect example right there. Is this kind of oh well, I can follow joy and feel this joy in all oh, the the opinion of the multitude likes me today. I got a bunch of likes on my post, and it was great. I. I won that argument on the internet. It was amazing. Uh, I felt so much joy. Uh, yeah, to have your your power of acting be determined by that is clearly not ideal. Is you? I mean, you're throwing it away to very uh, irrational forces. So yeah, that that passive joy. And how, yeah, joy is bad only insofar as it prevents man from being capable of acting. And so to that extent also, we cannot be determined to any action which we could not do if we were guided by reason. Insofar as joy is good, it agrees with reason that a man's power of acting is increased or aided and is not a passion except insofar as the man's power of acting is not increased to the point where he conceives himself and his actions adequately. So if a man affected with joy were led to such a great perfection that he conceived himself and his actions adequately, he would be capable, more capable of the same actions to which he is not determined from affects, which are passions, but all affects, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so it's clear that you have joy there that is in fact not good. And so when he talks also about later, okay, so I was reading from Proposition 59. Later, he talks about this comparison. Okay, well, so good and evil, they are comparative and relative to each other, which doesn't mean completely it is uh, arbitrary relativism. It's a very specific, concrete relation that he's talking about. Uh, and he mentions in there, too, that in some cases, a joy is bad compared to something that, from another perspective, would be considered bad. And I think that's another just another point where joy does not equal good in the most simplistic sense you can't extrapolate from that and then say that anything that causes joy spinoza would improve of or that this ethics is is advocating just any kind of joy at all is is great um yeah I don't know what do you, what do people think about 
this comparison of what he's talking about in Proposition 58 with this love of the, the opinions of the multitude determining us and this comparison with social media, because I, I think it's very strong and very interesting. I mean, I'm my personal reflection um, is that like I, I do groups with, I lead groups with people at my job. And, you know, it's like the like, you know, emotional or intuitive feedback I get from a group and how like that'll rip me in different directions like every fucking day, right? It's like sometimes a group is just like lively and entertained. Other groups just seem bored. And kind of like I find myself always just like so sensitive to what they're thinking or, or their mood in general. And it's like, yeah, it just kind of rips me back and forth. Um, and it's like, I guess finding that for me, it's like finding that balance of respect for the multitude, but not being determined by the multitude. I, I um when you were saying that chase also i was reminded of um i think um eric put something down in the chat about celebrities you know how so many celebrities um did you ever see that very interesting conversation years ago between madonna and uh warren Beatty? it was when they were seeing each other and for those of us who are older, Warren Beatty was considered a bit of um, for Warren Beatty to be the representative of traditional values would have caused you to laugh, um, you know, because he was known as a womanizer and all that. But he's talking to Madonna and her throat doctor is is actually examining her. And this is on film. It's a documentary on Madonna. And I have absolutely no idea how I stumbled over this. But anyway, so the doctors, invent, you know, checking out her throat and he's really giving her an examination and Beatty is saying look isn't why, why in effect you said why is this on film I mean why is this being filmed this is very serious isn't it and she says oh well but I want my fans to really know everything I'm going through and you see you see something turn in Beatty's head and he says oh Oh, I see now. This examination is going to be less real to you if it's not being filmed, right? It's the actual act of being filmed so it can be watched that is going to give it more reality. And he, and he, and he laughs a little. And the, the doctor gives Beatty a huge grin. And it's and 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 I, I thought that that is that was so perfect. Too. And I'm not just picking on Madonna from 20 years ago, but a certain kind of celebrity and 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 that and and look at how celebrity culture has in, been infused throughout all of of, of 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 broader U.S. culture, right? And it's and and I do think that social media has picked up on that. And we don't really have conversations via social media, but 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 screaming at each other and trying to whip up a mob and to get people to either hate or like us, but then that just gets through the whole mill. But I think all of that is of a piece. I had a similar reaction to, to what Ed mentioned earlier. When I read this, uh, when I was reading this, my wife was in the room um, and I read this and I said, this reminds me of someone. And she started laughing because we both immediately thought of Trump. And, you know, so that was my reaction. I, I mean, I, I, you know, I think you're right in terms of, of the, like the implications for social media, but um, just in general figures who are obsessed with, with the, with the public and that their entire uh, identity revolves around some kind of public you know the public accolades and and so on um which you know i don't know a lot of this stuff because i don't follow it but the so you know social influencers and and those sorts of folks whose entire livelihood depends upon um collecting favorable opinions from the mob as it were seems like that is a big part of contemporary social culture 
so what that also reminds me of is how people will be surprised by the fact that celebrities or social influencers or whatnot some news will come out they're i don't know horribly depressed or one of them commits suicide or something like that and people will be surprised by it like oh this person had everything uh you know all these people loved them and admired them and they look how many likes they had and they had so many followers i just i can't understand it um i think that's a pretty clear okay why it actually doesn't lead to uh overall joy i would say to have you know a bunch of likes on facebook or followers on instagram or whatever clearly or uh to be say a famous actor or something like that and instead that's something where yeah you're being determined by external causes your image is is caught up in these people that you don't know you don't you have no kind of of reciprocal relationship with them you know there's the what is it called the oh parasocial relationships that so this is where somebody will i would say they're a youtuber and so they share everything with of their life not everything but a great deal of intimacy from their life where the viewer feels like they know this person and yet that person has no idea that that person even exists so you have this completely asymmetrical relation so paris parasocial relations and i think that is yeah that's an example for both parties of something where okay yeah they're following some kind of you know minor passive joy but ultimately this is to be determined by external causes and therefore your the actual power of acting that you have to determine yourself to have you know uh some kind of feedback mechanism of self-understanding of your own power that feeds into what you actually do that's uh disrupted by this these false images that we have and also the fact that we're just at the whim of public opinion like he's talking about but um yeah i don't know it all seems quite relevant to me Uh, maybe this is jumping back too much in the weeds of uh, previous sections, but I, you know, in this section, he says things like, um, he talks about desire that arises from emotion versus desires that arise from reason, or a desire, this is Proposition 61, a desire which arises from reason cannot be excessive. And then in Proposition 60, he talks about the desire arising from pleasure or pain, which is related to, and so on. Um, so all through here, he keeps, he, he uses language like that. But the thing that I'm getting, I'm one thing I'm confused about is, you know, the relation between, see, I think uh, my translation uses pleasure and pain instead of joy and sadness. Um, but that he... he I, d I still have a hard time figuring out what is the relationship between between joy, sadness, desire, and reason, because you know he says desire is the you know is the essence of each thing. So fundamentally, in the, as, and I guess desire being the power of action, something like that. Um, and and there you know then there's passive and active emotions, and passive emotions are those emotions insofar as we are acted upon. Active emotions, I think, are the emotions associated with acting, and and 
action is associated with reason, you know, that that having uh, like understanding an adequate idea, it somehow is action. But anyway, I, I have a hard time keeping all that straight. And so, you know, in particular, I guess I, I'm when he when he what does he mean when he says things like desire arises from reason when desire is i thought the primary constitution of a thing and but then also he says that i thought the primary and i you know i sometimes he uses the word essence sometimes he uses the word nature i'm not sure he means the same thing all the time when he uses so sometimes when he uses one of those words he seems to be talking about like about humanity in general, like the essence of, of a human person is, you know, reason or something. But then he talks about essence and nature, talking about the individual person, like each individual person has their own essence. And, you know, like insofar as people's essences agree with one another, great things happen, but when they disagree, they don't. So all that is very confusing. But I guess to, to, to maybe put forth a, a simple, que a simpler question is what does he mean when he says things like desire arises from reason or desire arises from joy or sadness, given again that I thought desire was primary, you know, I thought pleasure and pain, you know, like pleasure is the emotion or joy is the emotion that arises from action, from being active. And activity is the, I thought, the um, the uh, actualization of desire. And so what does it mean then to say that desire arises from pleasure? So I'm just having a hard time keeping all that straight. And again, if, you know, this, this section seems to be more concerned with these uh, higher level concerns that we've been talking about, you know, like... Um, the social implications of these things and political implications. So maybe, you know, maybe it's unfair of me to, to ask a sort of a retrograde great question, but it's just kind of bugging me. So I don't know if anyone can clarify that, you know, relation between power or between desire, joy, sadness, and reason. I, I guess I want to take a stab at it. And I feel like if Chase can clean it up because <laughs> I feel like I have some similar confusions and I, I put it in the discord like a few weeks ago when I was just like desire seems to me like it doesn't sit next to sadness and joy even though you know there, there are parts where he says like the three primary affects desire sadness and joy um, but I, I guess sadness and joy makes sense to me and then I guess desire like when you're saying that Nevit about arising from this, arising from that, and that the sense I've gotten is that desire can kind of like arise from anything. Uh, desire is like the striving. Um, and what, you know, I think a few weeks ago we did have somewhat of a similar conversation on what are the things we can equate desire with? Like, was it essence? Was it power? Was it virtue? Uh, but my impression is that just off the top of my head is that desire can arise from from sadness from joy from different affects but it can also say arise from reason and that joy isn't necessarily tied to action because they there's joyful passions there's sad passions but then there's also joyful actions and action is necessarily joyful but joy can be active or passive and that joy can be caused by ourselves but it can also be caused by something external to us but something caused by ourselves is necessarily going to be joyful not sad and then my impression is that desire can arise say from reason but desire can also be kind of tied to to passions and affects from outside but, but part of, of, of my question is if desire is primary what does it mean to say that desire arises from an affect because you know he he multiple time multiple times says desire is the essence you know is the I, or me, I don't know what the word was but like desire is the primary thing and in that one passage where he says you know where he says there's those three those three affects uh you know joy sadness and desire shortly after that then he he says 
you know, within a page or so, he says something like, but actually joy and sadness, you can kind of cash out in terms of desire. So it's like this desire is the thing. And yet here he's talking about desire arising in, re, you know, like as a result of some kind of affect. And, and, and that's part of what confuses me. I was going to take a stab um, and then chase some time out or, or, or what, but uh, I wanted to say like for Spinoza, the only thing that's unconditioned or undetermined by anything external is nature or God. So desire is always going to be determined by something which isn't desire. It may be determined by the affects or it may be, to be, be determined by reason or maybe determined by a combination, or maybe even a third factor that we isn't brought up or we can't cognize. But it seems to me that at, on a level, you're right when you're saying desire is primary, but it's there's something behind it. You know, from the perspective of the individual act, you know, as the individual thing as an essence acting in the world, we can start by looking at desire. But there's a bigger picture from the earlier sections. Or, or or maybe it's the other way around. I mean, what you're saying makes me, and I, you know, maybe Chase can can pull this up because I can't remember exactly. But there's a similar move that Deleuze and Guattari make. Um, you know, th but that if desire is primary, what you're saying makes me think something like there's always desire there, but that desire it's, but it's it's not. It doesn't inherently include a a talos. It doesn't inherently. In, uh, include a direction so that desire is always there as a motive force but you kind of have to point it some direction and so maybe that's what happens this effect this affect kind of you know kind of gives it a a, a, a place to move because I I mean I remember there was that that argument that we had and I think I think it was Deleuze and Guattari versus I can't remember Hegel or somebody, but where they seem to be arguing a similar kind of a thing that there was, uh, you know, this this sort of primary force. I maybe it was even desire, and and people were saying, no, you desire you first. There must be an object of desire, and it is that object that draws forth desire. Where they seem to be saying, no, there is primarily desire, and then something else comes uh, you know uh, comes into into view which then desire moves toward but that desire is initially already there and so your comment makes me think maybe you know maybe something like that's going on here that desire is primary but that it can't it can't go anywhere until it has you know till till it's given direction perhaps by an affect or something yeah yeah, so I think what Eric said about desire, I think that's, I definitely agree with that. And that the key thing for desire is that it is our essence. So, okay, a few of these equivalent terms. So essence equals power of acting, which is also uh, virtue. I think there's a few more that can kind of go in there, but it's mainly those three are equivalent. So desire is our essence um, insofar as it's, as it's been determined. So this, would, okay. So this goes into once again, that distinction with essence and existence for a mode. So the essence has to do with that relation of motion and rest, speed and slowness. So if you think about it, that's something that, you know, it's kind of uh, eternal, at least in Spinoza's sense, but it's not necessarily realized until in existence, some actual parts come together that realize that relation. So for that to happen the way that it is actually determined that would be desire so desire okay so i think um how to relate it to joy and sadness that would be so joy is our essential power when it's increased 
and which is also the Kanatis, you know, striving to uh, persevere and whatnot. Um, sadness is the decrease of it. So, uh, but what is being increased and decreased then, in that case, is also desire. So desire is our essence as as power, but it's been determined by something so that most so for if it's been determined by an affect, an external cause, then it becomes a transitive relation, meaning that it has an object that it's about. Um, so this would be okay, my desires okay i don't know something stupid uh facebook i don't know i'm into facebook i want my my likes on facebook my desire has been determined by that so now my desire is about that so there's a transitive relation there but because of that that's you know kind of what we're talking about it's a passion and not an active relation at that point so when desire becomes active, I think that's when it becomes an intransitive relation and that it becomes a reflexive relation at the same time. So desire, instead of being about something external, it becomes about its own increase. So that desire desires an increase of itself. And I think... That could also work for Deleuze and Guattari and anti Oedipus. That when uh, I'll spare the the terms for <laughs> anti Oedipus, um, but it'd be something like, yeah, desiring. Okay, I say that now. I'm just gonna go ahead and say them. So desiring production, you know. That's kind of this productive engine of the universe and everything. Uh, for that, when it's operating in this active way, it's intransitive and it's inherently intransitive. But the thing is that there's always some kind of social production involved and that can uh turn it into something that is a transitive relation. So it's suddenly about something other than itself. It becomes alienated in a sense. And that is going to be, I think, roughly about the same that Spinoza is talking about in terms of, yeah, desire. When uh, So I think, okay, that's also what a reason would be. Reason is desire or a reason, uh, a desire that is in accord with a reason would be one that desires to increase its own power, which again is desire also itself, as insofar as it exists and it's determined, but it'd be self-determined in this case, which that's, that's what, uh, freedom is for spinoza so what what does what does desire re, what is reflexive desire so reflexive desire re, desires the increase in power what does that mean i you know so in in this section he says things like the you know the happiest life is the or the is the the life of i think something like the life of contemplation or something like that so is that what is that what uh, self-regarding or self-directing desire does is increase like is it the our, the increase of our own understanding is that what that that is that sort of not in in the sort of intransitive desire that desires increase of power is that to desire increase of understanding then yeah yeah and that's that's also what reason is okay yeah so i yeah that was actually one uh, I don't know, phrase or whatnot, description of reason that helped me understand is that so the the mind, its power of acting is understanding. So reason in this case would be kind of just that 
it's the power of power of understanding. But now desire, when desire is determined, it's self-determined. That means that it would desire uh, its own power of understanding, an increase of it. So, yeah, it's kind of, I guess, how else could I put it? Um, so, you know, for the mind, the understanding, that relates to it, and that works. But uh, you could also talk about it in terms more generally of just power of acting, which would relate to both of the, uh, the attributes. So that would be something like, okay, if if I desire uh, to increase my own uh, power or striving, that would be, okay, so what is the power of striving? You know, it's the uh, the power to be able to persevere in existence, to keep existing. So this would be something that it increases my ability to keep existing. It's somewhat of a simplification of it, but so if I desire not only to just keep existing as kind of an abstract thing, but in a way that actually fulfills it just inherently and automatically, um, maybe not automatically, but that would be this uh, reflexive kind of relation of desire. So desire is the striving for striving to strive in a way that bolsters itself where it strives just for itself. That would be it. Um, it's it's difficult to, to uh, talk about all these reflexive relations because they sound like gibberish, but um, that's, the, that's the name of the game. So well, what, it, yeah. I mean, what it, it seems consistent. And again, if I have this right, that he thinks if I understand what he said earlier before that that when we that the if we have adequate ideas, if we actually really understand what's happening, then that increases our power because it makes it because we're actually acting in a sense acting in accord with reality rather than with uh you know these inadequate ideas that cloud our our minds and so insofar as self self-focused desire increases my power if it increases my understanding then that also increases my ability to act so to the degree I have an increase in in um, adequate ideas or a better a better grasp of adequate ideas, I become more effective and more active in just in general. So is I mean is that does that make is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So I could see then why you know if you if you would say if you would you know like you were saying that desire intransitive desire is a desire to increase my own power and what that also means is increase in the activity of reason which means increasing in the you know the number of adequate ideas i have which is then going to have the effect of making increasing my power not only in my mind but in in my body as well yeah yeah i think that's right Yeah, keeping the keeping all those things in in mind is definitely difficult. It, especially because there's so many uh these synonymous words that he has, but that he he does seem to use some to emphasize aspects more than others. I think uh nature is one that he seems to use in particular ways, although I think technically, I guess. It would be the same as essence, but he does seem to use it more in the way that he thinks of. Um, well, this is somewhat this is speculation, really. I might be wrong about this, but so your essence for a mode that's going to be 
for the most part, an individual thing. But the thing is, uh, individuals for Spinoza, if you, if you remember uh, all the way back in book two, so my body is an individual and it has its own essence, but it's composed of an infinite amount of other individuals. And those individuals are also composed of individuals and so on and so forth. So in the same way, also, I'm composed in some larger individual, which we could say is something like, I don't know, maybe this group. This group has a kind of individual kind of nature going on. Um, and also, so maybe the city I'm in, something like that. Uh, so the essence will relate to what is that proportion of movement of parts that makes up that essence. Uh, of that individual. So that would be the essence, but the way that he talks about nature seems to be when he's talking about those kind of um, larger essences, the larger social bodies, maybe we could say. So it would be something, uh, so yeah, the, or natural types for something like the human. So the human human nature, he's talking about what um, individual human essences have in common. So is I don't think that would technically be an essence, but I think that that's a common notion, which would be so that can be an adequate idea if we understand it in the same way that if we understand our human nature that we understand all these different ways that a human, insofar as they are human, can agree with us as humans, and that we can compose these relations in ways that do all the fun stuff that Spinoza advocates, you know, increase our power, joy, active joy, not passive. Uh, well, you do passive joys, to a certain extent, but yeah. But yeah, I, you know, now that you you recall that stuff from earlier, what that reminds, you know, when he's talking about the traditional notion of essence, like the, you know, like a platonic essence or something that his, his, uh, what his comments reminded me of Nietzsche's stuff in um, Truth and Lies that, you know, where, you know, Nietzsche says, well, the essence of something is just when you think about things and then forget all the differences but really there is no there is, it's not like there is a real essence the essence is just this conceptual this concept that we get when we abstract all the differences away and and you know he seemed to be saying something similar but then saying nevertheless we do have to use these things because otherwise you can't talk about for example humans but that there is no human essence in the sense of, you know, like you were saying, like there's each individual essence, but there is no human essence, really. But you can have a concept like that in which, again, like you say, you you uh, you cluster all the common features of this of these types and you can talk about human nature as long as you realize that that's not you, is you're not reifying that as some kind of platonic essence that really it's a conceptual category for these kinds of things that have certain features in common something like that so i had kind of forgotten about that that he doesn't you know he doesn't he's he's trying to avoid reifying those kinds of essences yeah yeah so there's a complex relation with Essence, essences, common notions, and then you can also talk about how those differ from the abstract universals that he also talks about, I think, in the second book. Uh, so I think what you just described, that was that's basically the relation of essences and common notions, where I think the the nature of human, you know, 
that is that's a common notion, I think, for humans. Uh, so essences would be those are singular. So those you know they are themselves differences and they're completely unique. Where common notions are are agreements of those essences. And so they're going to be more or less general. So you can think of, uh, so at least Deleuze calls them, he talks about them as an art of concepts. Uh, so I think, don't worry so much about that, but more, I think the word concept as like a general concept helps. And that that also distinguishes it from the abstract universal that he talks about. So that would be, I think he, uh, he says that, okay, when we have some idea like, uh, okay, human as a rational animal, something like that, or a, a human is, you know, a, walks is a bipedal animal without feathers or, you know. So he's saying that... Uh, when we have those universal definitions like that, that that uh, is the result of we take sensible differences that affect us in a particular way. Uh, you know, whatever is the most prominent thing we will take. I mean, I think this is clear from the way that we think of. Uh, well, I think race is, a, is a, definitely a thing like this, where we take sensible differences that for whatever reason, we're determined and affected by, and we pick those out, and then we minimize the the other differences, pass those over, and then group things according to uh, whatever it is this particular sensible difference um, seems to be grouping together. And that's what I think he would consider an abstract universal. So... But those are purely conceptual, right? Those, yeah. So uh, uh, he thinks of those as inadequate ideas. Hmm. So it'd be something like, okay, if I, I mean, okay, let's just go with like race or something. Like, uh, so a white person, you know, it takes okay, uh, the level of melanin in your skin is this uh, like a particular shade, uh, you know. But of course, in reality uh, the shades of our skin are actually all uh, quite unique and different um but it's the thing is that it's not really telling you something about those members in the group in a way that uh is actually part of the essences of them so i mean you can think of this in the traditional way of essence in that okay well first of all if i get sunburned my skin color changes you know um it's obviously not part of my essence. I won't die if, if I get sunburned. Um, but I think that's, I mean, kind of a silly example, but I think that's what he's talking about as this abstract concept. That's an inadequate idea where, okay, what would be a good idea? It would be something, okay, so I think there's kind of been, there's a, kind of some tension with, uh, you know, with the role of science or whatnot in this it seems to me like it, it would play somewhat of a role in that if you could understand you know uh just biology basically it would help to conceive these common notions or the ways that our essences would agree so if i were to talk about the human in a way that would not be abstract but would be this common notion I think it would have to be built on something kind of like a uh, biological knowledge of, say, our bodies and the way that, okay, uh, a poison. So I know if I whatever, drink arsenic or something like that, that it will deteriorate my body. So, of course, this isn't just for humans, but for animal bodies or something like that. A common notion would be some would be understanding the way that the 
arsenic and the mammal body would uh how they would interact and compose or decompose each other really and um that's so that would be an example of something that's not just a singular essence but also not an abstract universal so i don't know if maybe that was confusing i don't know but uh and that yeah. that would those you think would be adequate ideas those kinds of yeah yeah So I think he says also, though, we can have adequate ideas of our essences. So that, too, would be. I mean, that's kind of. Uh, oh, never mind. That's that's too too far out. But, um, yeah, I think at least it seems thinking about it in the ways of bodies and you know animal species and whatnot i think just makes it a little more concrete and comprehensible i don't know i mean just to to draw another connection with nietzsche you know nietzsche says there are, are no things because uh the way i think about it is that all there are grades of density um and then we kind of you know, we kind of create these, not exactly arbitrary, but we create create these, or the, the mind has to create these divisions to, to make sense of things. But it, it sounds like a kind of similar thing, like when you were saying for Spinoza, every individual is composed of individuals, which are composed of individuals and so on, that really what you have is just this, I don't know if it would be a continuity for him, but you have like this just collection of, like you say, an infinite number of individuals that then are grouped in various you know, in various numbers because of this speed thing, you know, and, 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 uh, and then we call that an individual because of, you know, these, these, this particular group of individuals kind of move together, but, um, you know, but individual is kind of a loose term there in a way, but, or at least it's a relative term. And, and then um, what you think of as a kind of thing is again a little bit arbitrary because because of the fact that the notion of individual i don't know if arbitrary is the right word but the notion of individual depends on the you know the scope that you're talking about and so therefore what counts as a a kind of thing would depend upon how many of these individuals that are kind of moving together um so like you know like your example here if we are a seminar if we are a kind of individual because we are all in in a, in some sense moving to yeah an aggregate moving or wait i guess we would be a molecular aggregation <laughs> anyway that we're that we're kind of moving together at the in this similar way um then you could talk about I don't know if the essence would be the right word but you could talk about the defining features of this group you know, and in a in a as a kind of individual, but yeah. Anyway, I'll stop talking now. Uh, 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 Chase, I I thought. I mean, I think you were <clears throat> referring to race as as a concept and as an identifier and a classificatory term, but you can also um, think. I, I was thinking of the the the, the gender differences, men and women. And how, yes, obviously there are physical, biological differences between men and women, but obviously we're part of the same species because you can have sexual reproduction that produces offspring that when adult can engage in sexual reproduction, right? It's not like we create mules from that. Um, but look at how people can take a um, a difference or differences and then extrapolate from them to a ridiculous extent that really has nothing to do with the biological, uh, psychological, mental capacity of one of the genders. And so you could get people who are literally saying, well, oh my God, you can't have women be overly educated. That could overstimulate them and they could be go, they can go insane because, and they, they were making a physiological, in, in quotation marks, making a physiological argument that their constitutions could just not sustain that kind of heavy uh, mental lifting 
And so, I mean, I, I thank you for bringing it up because that does seem to me to, to that, that that to me that it seems like what what Spinoza is doing last week and this week is really cautioning us, attempting to caution us multiple times. Right, be careful with your categorizations. Be careful of even your emotions because, you know, I, I think we've known people who you know no one ever wants to say stop being sad or whatever. But if someone is still grieving over something that happened two years before, I could see how some Spinoza might say, I, I mean, in modern terminology, we might say that's not healthy, but I think he might use a different vocabulary, but just say it, it would be better if you stop doing that. And, and what is the origin of that sadness after two years? Yeah, I think that that definitely works. And I, there's a lot of feminists that work with Spinoza and do a bunch of stuff with Spinoza. Uh, and I think they, a few things are, are said along the same lines, it seems like. Uh, so another thing that, that reminded me of is in part three, when he's talking about the affects, he talks about how when we're affected by something and we associate it with this image of a, I think he uses national nationality of national origin, something like that of a, or just like a, the identity of a people that if we know that the, what is affected us is associated with that. We tend to then uh, expand that to the whole group membership. So I think there that's he's talking about something that that's what you see with forms of, you know, racism and sexism and and whatnot. I think. But also in his case, it would be he's talking specifically about national identity in there. But uh, I think it would work for us. I mean, Spinoza's Jewish. Living in the 17th century, especially, I mean, not that it gets any better, but uh just the massive anti-Semitism that he was uh, subjected to. Uh, I think he probably had some experience of that and somewhat, yeah, I would say he probably knew what he was talking about um, and that the affects work this way or something along that uh, with national identities, with ethnic identities, but uh Indeed, a lot of these are inadequate ideas that, yeah, we've been determined by certain external causes to focus on, you know, this feature or something like that uh, in order to give us this abstract ID. Um, but, yeah, there's a really determined... Uh, is there, well, does it really give us, you know, uh, knowledge where we can then figure out how that idea and the members of that arrangement, how they could actually combine with other arrangements or how they would disagree or, you know, in order so that we can do this work of reason where we we want to understand how things agree with each other. So, yeah, uh, there's one, I was trying to think of some examples earlier. Um, and I think one thing, okay, so I know it's after eight, uh, not that we, I'll just, why not, let's go and say it. Um, so one of the examples I thought of, you know, what is this kind of like work of reason that he's talking about and coming to agreements with things? Um, so I was thinking, okay, if you have a couple or yeah, let's go the couple and they're, but they, they're fighting. It's something is, something is wrong. You know, there's, there's joy involved, but there's also, uh, a lot of sadness and it's been a very specific sense of those terms. So then they go to counseling. So what does the counselor do? The counselor tries to explain to them, you know, 
how they can actually agree with each other based off of uh, their essences in the Spinoza sense. Uh, I think that's something kind of like what he's talking about with the role of reason and whatnot and all those related concepts. And I think you could also say that there's something like that, not just for a couple, but it would be even, you know, different peoples that, okay, how do we, if we understand what we are, then we can better understand in what ways we would agree with uh, other people or disagree with them. And based off that, we can compose these more agreeable relations. I mean, in a way, it seems like it seems very simple, but I don't know. It seems like seems like a, a easier way to understand it. I don't know. I, I would think that he was purposely. Well, I mean, I, <laughs> it's just the way you said it. It's just so I apologize because I'm not a Spinoza scholar, but. I found if if I try to deal with someone's prejudice directly, it's I'm bouncing a, a, a basketball off a brick wall. I mean, it's it's not it's not. So I have to go sideways. You know, I have to I have to not talk about that thing that they're prejudiced against. I have to talk about something else or other things. And I have a, my my sense is that. And remember, he's in the Netherlands, isn't he? I mean, that and the Netherlands had a reputation of being more tolerant. Uh, towards uh, people of the Jewish persuasion. So, I so um, I mean, it wasn't like in other countries. So, I mean, my, my sense is he, he purposely might be doing th this kind of reasoning without saying anything about any particular religion or nationality or, or, or even classes, right? You know, a lot of times there's a prejudice towards poor people oh they're poor because you know they want to be poor or they're a drug addict or they're a drunk or whatever um and it's like well, wait a second what about accumulated wealth you know that 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 and that's why people can be families can be in poverty over multiple generations um you know it's not like people's wealth comes out of nothing um so i i have a feeling that that's that's that, that's just my sense that that's why he's approaching it sideways and and and, and and pulling things like this and talking about well yes there are differences but does that necessarily mean that that we can extrapolate from that and see these uh, tie other other characteristics together I mean in some ways I think he's isn't he trying to be the, to suggest a certain amount of little e empiricism like look at the person or the thing in front of you and deal with it as itself rather than as an example of of something that is um a a a a, a unit of a part of a larger group yeah that that makes a lot of sense to me and um so i think another way of thinking about that would be i mean it's kind of rephrasing what you just said but if I'm tr if I disagree with somebody, I don't just simply right off the bat go straight into that disagreement. Otherwise, it will just be no progress at all. Okay, we disagree. You know, that's all you can do. But so this is actually something that uh, I know at least some of you know current day Spinozists or whatnot it, at least one in a podcast I listened to. Uh, he was interested in uh, basically convincing people of things for or um, rhetoric, I guess, the <laughs> something like that. But okay, how do we how do you if people have completely irrational ideas, how would you convince them otherwise? How does how do you actually, you know, the sufficient cause to help people be more rational. I think it's something kind of like this would be, okay, yeah, don't go straight into the, the core of the disagreement. Things can't come together in the disagreement. Instead, 
you have to approach it sideways and show first, you know, where there's some kind of commonality and then do a kind of, I don't know, dialectic back and forth to try to to see, you know, kind of where the overlaps are. I think that's the only way you can have some kind of at least a partial agreeable relation in that way. So I think he that's something like what he's talking about. Um yeah. I I'm thinking of uh well depends what you're exactly who you're trying to convince about what to um but okay so one thing okay uh when I worked at Lowe's I remember I had this coworker who was a very hardcore fundamentalist born again Christian and he found out I was a philosophy major or something like that and it's like what do you know about truth and I was just like uh I just wanted to like say something about uh Nietzsche but I'm like mm, I don't know like out of this is this conversation is probably not going to end in a agreeable relation but how can I really kind of turn to something where at least it's I don't know it's interesting to me it was I have to I'm stuck here you know for the next what, six hours uh and I have to work with this person for you know a while um so I should probably not go full bore into uh just destroying <laughs> this person's belief system not that I could even do that but um yeah, so I tried to find some kind of common ground, and uh, spoiler alert, it didn't didn't exactly work out. But at least it wasn't uh, hostile. I would say it was kind. Of, yeah, we disagreed a little. He tried to explain the the universe to me uh, with the metaphor of a football team and a coach, with God being the the coach, and the universe being the the football team i was like yeah okay yeah oh yeah you have to be real careful with metaphors because one bad one you just totally invalidate your entire <laughs> what you I think of people's eyes <laughs> i prefer the god is the tyrant of the universe metaphor <laughs> yeah <laughs> And whatever God says is that's it. And if you disagree, well, you're gonna burn in hell. That's... Oh, did you did you ever see the 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 Seth MacFarlane movie? Uh, I don't know what was it, A, a Thousand Ways to Die in the West. I thought I, I would have thought all of you would have seen it because you I would think would enjoy that kind of humor. But uh, he's talking to the main female character in it, and it's out. I I, I have no idea if it's colorado or you know where it is but it's somewhere out in the old west uh where people are being gored by bulls on a daily basis and or crushed by a gigantic piece of a block of ice that they've just imported from maine and um and it's it's a really sad disease i don't know if it's spinal bifida or if it's muscular dystrophy and he brings up the disease and the other character says oh i've never heard of that what is, what is that and he goes oh it's just one of the many ways that god shows his infinite love to us <laughs> and i thought ouch <laughs> yeah that's definitely my kind of humor <laughs> well chase shall we call it uh so one last thing. Uh, so I would. So I talked to Alistair Welchman yesterday, and I have some things. I talked to him about uh, Schopenhauer and the world as will and representation, mm -hmm. mainly because I was trying to avoid talking about my thesis because it gives me sad affects. So he was my <laughs> thesis advisor with the very very short time that I had, and he's he's pretty busy. Uh, I spent half of it talking about. <laughs> Schopenhauer, which has nothing to do with my thesis, but uh, yeah, but it was still worth it. So I asked, uh, okay, so I read the the first preface, which by the way is 
it's not philosophically important, but it's I think it's funny. It's it's worth reading just for entertainment, uh, because Schopenhauer says that um, first you need to read the principle of sufficient reason, which was like two hundred and fifty pages, something like that, and yeah, then same tradition, yeah, yeah, and then also the the book he had on colors, which was apparently it contradicted Goethe's theory of colors. And he gave it to Goethe to read, and then Goethe was like, "You bastard!" Who Eddie was, very, he was really young at the time. To do. Yeah, and it was just like, "Who, who the hell is this kid?" Yeah, and uh, and then uh, also you should be familiar with all of Kant's major works, is what he says. So that's the. I would agree with that last point anyway, though. Say what? I would, I would just agree with that last point anyway. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. We should be yeah. familiar with the critiques. Yeah. So, well, so do you want to start reading Schopenhauer a year from now? <laughs> oh, you want us to read not even a year from now. now. We're talking like probably three years from now. <laughs> <laughs> well, Eric can tell us in what order we should read what content, <laughs> and then we can go to the color. Um, essay where he insults good to um. yeah so uh sorry my cat's making noise uh but so i asked alistair okay okay the other thing he says is to read the appendix that is is schopenhauer's critique on kant is the appendix he says to read that first then read the whole book again and then to read it twice so I asked Alistair about this and he said uh basically that's all ridiculous. You don't need to read any of those things, except you should you should know something about Kant, like a little about Kant, but you don't need to read the the whole thing about the principle of sufficient reason, the color book. He yeah, he uh rolled his eyes at the color book thing, was just like, oh god. Yeah, uh, but and you don't need to read the appendix first. And in fact, so I asked him about possible things to, uh, you know, um, abridgments, and he suggested that. If, so yeah, you don't. We don't need to read the the prefaces. And he said, if you're gonna not do any of these, then the appendix is was his uh, suggestion. But I wonder how, I don't know. I think he's, a. Uh, I mean, so he's a Kantian. He's told me he's, he's a type of Kantian, I think was his words. So I wonder how much he's thinking that it's a critique of Kant. But, I mean, I know he's more, uh, say, objective or whatnot than that. But, um, but he was basically saying, yeah, Schopenhauer's critique of Kant it's it's a little confused uh and it kind of wanders in places and uh so he was suggesting that but i was like oh i wonder i want to read that i don't know well i've been actually the last few days working on a reading guide or, or on a reading schedule and i what i have right now is i have us reading that excerpt that, that you know that you put together from from uh, critique of pure reason which is 35 pages i at this point i have us having only one discussion on that the thing is it would be awkward to split that up because like two-thirds of it is the transcendental aesthetic and one-third of it is the second analogy so I'm not sure, you know, if we split that up, it, it would be very uneven. But anyway, I have us doing one, one session on Kant and then having us reading, depending on the week, basically an average of 20 pages a week. And if we did that, we could get through the entire book, including the appendix, um, through the summer and the fall. So that's, that's ex excluding the prefaces, including Kant. And and then what I thought we could do is if we if we read if we talk about the the Kant excerpts, 
on the first meeting and we decide that we just need another another session we could say well let's just shift the schedule by a by a week and you know sh shift everything else by a week and do another session on Kant and then I could just it would be easy to revise the schedule based on that but that's kind of the you know my tentative plan at this point because again it, you know 20 pages a week is a is a fair amount in order to get through the book. But on the other hand, Schopenhauer is easier to read than a lot of these guys. Um, I mean, not that the ideas are not dense. He's just a more straightforward writer, I think. And from what I from what I heard from a German teacher years ago, uh, Nietzsche and Schopenhauer are probably the two easiest reads in German for philosophy. Now, easy, not in the sense of the ideas, but in the sense of just making sense of what, you know, they're uh, literally of the sentences, just trying to understand what what the, the what they're actually saying. So. I don't know. So does that sound reasonable, like start with Kant and then do 20 pages a, a week in the summer and fall? Yeah, that sounds reasonable. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. This is my voice. Yes. Yeah, so um, sure. Do we usually meet this time? Is it six to eight Thursdays? So that's another thing is I was th uh, thinking of shifting if you guys are amenable to back to, I guess, seven to nine on Fridays. Um, that's a time that Joey can meet. And the, the, the person who objected to that was Tristan, and he hasn't been attending these. He wants a book, but he, he has. So, you know, if 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 he was if he really wanted to attend and he couldn't make that then we could do maybe friday six to eight i think is what we did before but i was thinking tentatively go back to friday seven to nine um how are you guys with that is that okay yeah that should usually work and not not are you not thinking next for uh this coming friday tomorrow i, I have plans no no this would start may 19th so we oh, still okay have, yeah, that's, that's very doable i don't know like a couple of sessions on Spinoza, I think. And I think, I think only two more weeks. Yeah. And so on Spinoza, I assume we would continue this Thursday six to eight meeting. But then the the way I've I've got the tentative schedule set up is we would start May 19th, which is a Friday, and then do that, you know, basically 20 pages a week through the summer and fall. Yeah, that should work for me. I know uh, there'll be one weekend in June where Friday I'll be out of town, but that's only one time. Well, I mean, the way these things work. So Evan, uh, for those of you who don't know, Evan is a, is a grad student at, at Texas State. He's in the MAPI program, and he's the guy that uh, asked for a um, independent study on this book. And so he's the reason that I that I begged the seminar to read Spinoza so I didn't have to read Spinoza while also reading something incredibly difficult like a crit critique of pure reason or something at the same time. So, um, so, if, and, and as far Evan is, as attendance goes, this, this seminar is extremely loose. So All right. we'll come and go as they have to. And, you know, no one gets upset if you miss a meeting or, or five or 10. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, we're going to start with something did you say that you're able to order through the department so the because everybody says we should start with kant i am taking so alistair welchman is is chase's advisor he also is the translator of the most well probably I guess the most he and his wife are the translator of the most recent edition of of, of schopenhauer of the awesome. world yeah that's the book and that's the one i'm going to try to get craig to buy us although it's very expensive so we'll see what happens when i ask for like 10 copies of that <laughs> um but i'm going to ask and and alistair welchman also is familiar with and teaches kant and so he both he and chase sent me his syllabus on 19th century see a on 19th century philosophy and i'm uh and Chase and I are recommending reading the passages that Alistair Welchman recommends we read in Critique of Pure Reason, which is about 35 pages. And so uh, Chase put together a PDF uh, of those ex excerpts, and I po posted that on, on Discord. 
And I could also send it out as when the, you know, a week or so before the seminar, send it out as email. So the thought is we would start off with one week on Kant. And then my thought was then after that week, if we decide we need another week on Kant, we could just do the same reading the next week and shift Schopenhauer by a week. Otherwise, if we figured out we were, if we figured we were okay after that first week, we could just go to Schopenhauer then the the next week. Kant so said my... I'm 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 totally okay with two weeks on Kant. <laughs> well, I what I what I suggest we do is we read it and look at it and then talk about it and then in the meeting uh that first meeting on if you know if we meet on the 19th of may we can just say yeah we really or maybe if you know when people read it people will just say on discord or something we really need two weeks on this and if we do that then you know that's what we'll do oh that's awesome so um is that a pdf that you you would have you already sent that to me i know you sent me some things. Uh, i did not uh i sent you actually more than that i sent you though i sent you that as two separate pdfs and i also sent you a pdf of this that section on phenomena and noumena and then yeah. said actually you, you don't need that and alistair did not include that in a syllabus so okay i posted a, a pdf uh chase's pdf on discord in the uh, summer spring 2023 philosophy seminar um channel there's a pdf of the of the Kant excerpts that we're recommending for the first meeting that sounds great um anyone going to look at that little book that you you told me to get i remember i'm going to try to reread it i post oh, I, I got that oh did you yeah i got it too <laughs> i haven't read it even once i'm going to start like may 19th what is it? Kant's theory of knowledge. Yeah. <clears throat> this is the older, older edition, but it's the same. It's the same book. Um, it's very, it's very short. It's only 150 pages long. It is, it's the best introduction I've ever seen to critique of pure reason. It's, it's short and he cut he he covers the the big ideas of course he doesn't cover the details but it's a really good way i think a good way to get an overview of what kant is doing in critique of pure reason so um i posted a link to the hackett page on this i'm sure you can you can probably get it on amazon um but i'm not unless somebody unless somebody uh, really strongly recommends it i'm i'm not proposing that we read this as part of the seminar just a resource if people would like to read it on their own it's a good it's a good resource i don't know chase have you had to take taken a look at that yet yeah i read uh about 15 or so pages of it and i thought it was uh kind of exactly what we need and that it's a just a nice simple summary of kant uh well the crit critique of pure reason specifically and um i think that so yeah you don't need a really detailed knowledge of you know everything kant said uh okay. it's just the really like the general stuff um especially in the, the critique of peer uh critique of peer reason uh so schopenhauer does go into other elements of kant is moral theory and a little bit of the aesthetics although i asked um I asked Alistair about that and he said, you don't, you can just look on like Wikipedia and read about the critique of judgment on Wikipedia. And that's all you really need to know. Um, okay. And the Stanford Encyclopedia of Article of uh, Philosophy has a, a bunch of articles on Kant. So oh, yeah. that's, that's okay. another good resource. But I, I mean, I guess, you know, we could read this in the summer. <clears throat> The problem is it's another 150 pages, which if we read 20 pages, that's another, you know, seven or eight weeks or seven or eight. Yeah, seven or eight weeks, which would then increase the reading load on Schopenhauer to get it in. So that's why I was suggesting, you know, I posted a link to the book and just suggest to <clears throat> people take a look at it. And although Eric really, really does not want to be this person, we're also going to have a Kant explainer in the group. So... <laughs> Eric told told us, I don't I do not want to be the explainer in the seminar group, but he knows Kant better than I, I'm pretty sure better than any of us. So we can Great. always so good. Eric, what about this? Um 
uh, Nevin, would you would you be able to uh, uh, send this to you send the PDF you sent to Discord? Would you be able to send it to my email address? Because it's always easier for me at my uh, email address at the university at my university computer. Things PDF. Sure, I'll do that, and I'll also I'll include a link to this book. So, and I'll just send it to everybody so that thank you. You know, but. So, I, you know, I, I know Eric's background. We had a class together. I know it's way past time, but I actually don't. I guess are y'all all professors or associate professors or graduate students too? The three of you? Us? <laughs> I know you, Doc. I know who you are, Dr. Uh, Nevitt, but I don't, I don't, I guess Ed, Ed Mill and, and Chase and Christian, I don't think I know y'all's background. Uh, oh, I, 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 guess teach, uh, I teach in the political science department. I, I've been at Texas State since 1990. Awesome, awesome, and have a, and then Chase. It sounds like are you yeah. doing some dissertation or something? I uh, it so I'm in the MA program for philosophy at UTSA, so awesome. I'm doing my my MA thesis right now. He's oh, writing a was... fucking thesis, as he puts it sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. goddamn so fucking this... thesis. Oh, I hear that. So is it uh is is it on Schopenhauer or who are you writing it on? Uh, so I'm writing it on Deleuze. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I, I um next session I'd love for you to tell me what his background is because I'm not familiar with with Deleuze. I've and done a short conversation. <laughs> yeah, and then Christian, are you a student? Or are you done? Uh, we actually took uh, philosophy of science with Professor Hutchinson back. Oh, in the you fall, were in my but... philosophy of science. Yeah. How did that pan out with you and Dr. Hutchinson? I mean, I did just fine. I got an A. That's awesome. So. Yeah, no, it, it turned out. I learned a lot in his <laughs> class. I did learn a lot in his class. I just, um, it was hard to, hard. To, I mean, you know, I wish I could have spoke better into his listening, I think. But it was, it was good. Very learning. Very educational. Much learning, indeed. I liked yeah, that yeah. class. Chase was a, a, a philosophy undergrad at Texas State. Um, some of the other members of the group who've either left or weren't here tonight, there's uh, Hunter was also uh, he he graduated from the graduate program in the in this uh, last fall, and there are some people that are alumni of Texas State. There's some people that are just friends of people, and some people are friends of friends. And so it's just I mean anybody can join the group who has an interest, who's willing to read the books and, and has an interest in talking about them. So we awesome. we've collected you know various people you know like Joey was he he was a student a philosophy student at Texas State and he's now living what in Washington State is it is I, that right? I thought it was Portland but okay. I could oh uh, okay. Portland. I think I think he moved from Portland and now I think he lives in Washington oh okay I, my, I think that's right I might be wrong though but yeah Martin, did he uh, become did he decide to teach there in, in uh, Washington no he does uh i think it's uh like a rehab place or oh, cool. it's yeah something like that um he does counseling for somebody okay awesome all right well christian it's good to see you again I, yeah that was fun having you in class there y'all had some good we had some good <laughs> conversation listening to you and <laughs> dr hutchison that was entertaining that was a lot of lot to learn <laughs> uh Oh, yeah, I forgot to say, by the way, I got into University of Houston, so I'll be going there in the fall. Oh, that's awesome. Congrats. And, and was that your number one? That was the school I wanted to go to. All right. Excellent. So you're going nice. to do a congratulations. Graduate. Congratulations. Did you, uh, you're doing the, the graduate program there? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing my graduate degree in philosophy in their master's program, and then pray to God I can get to a PhD program after that. But one thing at a time. That's what we No, do. that's awesome. No, I, I actually I'm moving to Houston when I'm all done. I, I hope to uh, I plan to move to Houston with my master's in applied philosophy and ethics. And I'm actually considering University of Houston, but you know, among other possibilities. I love University of Houston for uh, after this. The biggest problem yeah. with University of Houston, in my opinion, is Houston. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you gotta I love, Houston. I love Houston. This is my home. <laughs> so I yeah, I'm not a big fan of Houston personally. It's just it's just a little too big for me. I don't, yeah, no. It also makes humidity. You know, right. It also makes us oh to yeah. Oh yeah. Like so, <laughs> there's too yeah. many roaches there. 
I, yeah, I, I don't. Uh, big yeah. roaches. I don't fish, oh, no. but I, I wear. I have so many fishing shirts just because they're great in like the hot, humid summers. Like, oh man, yeah, yeah. I've got Magellan shirts all over the place from Academy. <laughs> <laughs> I I love you. Yeah, yeah, my sister and her husband live in Houston. My best friend, dream girl, I've known her for 13 years. She lives in Houston. One of my good friends. So I got family there too. So I'm excited. Well, yeah, I've got family there anyway, too. But this yeah. is gonna be fun. I was actually I born so. in Houston. You what? I was born in Houston. Oh my god! Really? <laughs> yep. Wow. No, it happens. I mean, it's a big city. Now, you know. Yeah, somebody's got to be born there. I mean, you know. well, if, you, <laughs> if you're yeah. concerned about that, I, I have to fess up. Then I was born in Chicago, Illinois. Right. I was born in Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. This is cool. So, yeah. Well, shall we adjourn this is, then? This is, sorry, I came in late. Yeah, I think so. Um, Nobody worries. <laughs> like I said, this group is extremely All loose. Right. So, you know, you, people come in late, they leave early, they come when they can. They, you know, so yeah, we're very chill. Never doesn't points off. Yeah, no, I, I don't deduct points in your grade for <laughs> coming in late or leaving early. Yeah, totally. I, I am going to punish uh, Hunter. For just being hunter, I'm not sure how yeah. yet. But I think that's fair. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Excellent. Okay, all right. Adjourn it is. Y'all take care. I'll see you. Night, night. Right. See you later. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye.